Right. You're listening to the Radio Ammo Breakfast, only on Kiwi. Yeah. Let's talk politics with uh, Russell Norman, co-leader of the Greens this morning. Morning, Russell. Morning, Wemo. Have you heard the news come through this morning about the um, the uh, rather quick and swift justice over in China uh, with the executives uh, who have been held to account for the tainted milk scandal, the San Lu tainted milk scandal? Uh, they've been executed this morning. Yeah, I did hear that. Uh, no, no, we, did, we didn't hear much from Fonterra about this at all, did we? No, well, I mean, you know, Fonterra obviously got in over their head and um, got involved in, in something that, you know, was a bit beyond them. And But in the end, the crazy thing is actually made a huge amount of money as a result. Uh, because, mm. of course, people stopped buying Chinese milk products and bought New Zealand milk products. And one of the paradoxes is people keep saying the Chinese free trade deal was terribly successful. In fact, one of the key drivers of the increase in consumption of milk products in China from New Zealand uh, was the melamine scandal with San Lu. Yeah, now, and just to uh, refresh people's memories on this, uh, it was, does Fonterra, or did Fonterra own a stake in San Lu? How did, how did the business arrangement work there? Yeah, that, that's right. Um, they were involved with San Lu, um, and that they thought that that was the way to get into the Chinese um, milk market was that they'd buy a pre-existing company. Right. Um, it turned out, of course, that that pre-existing company, their supplies were being uh, contaminated with um, melamine, um, and the result was, of course, that um, thousands of babies got sick and some died. Now, do you find it extraordinary, even though even though the the um, people in, in Fonterra here had no direct uh, you know, involvement in in the melamine get, getting into that milk, um, but they're still quite happy to be involved in a company where people were found guilty and then could be executed. This is a New Zealand company involved with another company where the executives of that company have been executed in that in that country. Isn't that extraordinary? It, it is pretty extraordinary. Of course, Fonterra got out of it um, afterwards uh, after the whole scandal broke. No, they washed um, their hands. But- so they extricated themselves from right. it. Um, I mean, they, you know, they. Uh, I think that they themselves certainly didn't have any. You know, they they didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, and you know, it's uh, they've now got out of it, and they're actually just selling their own product in China and and being very successful at it because yeah, Chinese parents were looking for untainted milk product and yeah. saw New Zealand as a source of untainted milk product. Mm. As a as a as a safe source, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's part of part of our clean and green reputation. I mean, it, it, after the San Lu was one was when Fonterra stopped saying, uh, as they'd said for years, um, that you know uh, the clean and green image doesn't matter to them because you know it's irrelevant to Fonterra. Because every time we used the Greens used to say, look, your clean and green image is a tremendous you know the, is a tremendous marketing advantage. Fonterra would say rubbish, um, but after San Lu, they no longer say that. Mm. I, I, I just, I'm just, just finding it really hard to get my head around the idea of, you know, because we need, we need to do business in China. You know, China is really important as an export market for us, and, um, and, and, you know, we could be quite successful in exporting our products there. But, but there's the potential that if things go wrong, the companies that you could be involved with over there, if things go extraordinarily wrong, as they did in this case, the people involved could be executed. I mean, this is so foreign. This is, this is a foreign idea to, to the way we live our lives here in New Zealand. They can be executed, and uh, of course, they can be pretty much permanently detained as well. Let's not forget the the BHP executives, um, uh, rather Rio Tinto executives um, from Australia, who uh, were detained in China because the Australian government uh, prevented China Co, a big um, state-owned Chinese uh, mining company, from taking a big stake in Rio Tinto. So the Chinese responded by locking up some of the executives. Uh, from Rio Tinto in China, mm. so you know it's an authoritarian state. Um, well, you know, so, this is a, so, so authoritarian should, capitalism. Should should uh, companies who are doing business with China be making some kind of stand against these sorts of punishments that are, that are dished out? They should certainly be speaking out against it. I mean, because if people don't speak out against authoritarianism, then we'll be stuck with it for good. So, you know, companies have got a responsibility, just like the rest of us, to speak out against authoritarian capitalism which is the Chinese way at the moment yeah. uh, and you know that 
but they obviously they don't tend to do that much, but that's what they should be doing. Yeah. Well, moving on to uh, the issue back here that's um, sitting in Parliament at the moment. I, I, I realise you, you're sitting under urgency uh, while the government uh, puts through the emissions trading scheme. Um, I mean, what's, what's your role there when you're sitting in Parliament now? Because you, are you, you're just basically watching it happen, aren't you? Uh, well, I mean, basically Parliament now spends a third of, or more than a third of its time under urgency because the government doesn't want any proper scrutiny of its legislation, so it just rams everything through. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time under urgency. So we're back under urgency today because they're ramming this um, ridiculous changes to the emissions trading scheme through. And, you know, our job is to speak out about it. So we're, you know, taking as many speaking slots as we possibly can, moving as many amendments to improve it as we can. But, you know, on the, on the day when we discover that Antarctica is melting a lot faster than anyone realised, mm. a lot faster than anyone realised, um, the government is weakening our climate change regulation and it's a big payday for polluters in Wellington today mm. as the government hands out literally $110 billion by mid-century to their polluting mates. Uh, in, in regardless of, of um, what you think of, of the, the scheme itself and the way it's made up and how uh, kind of lightweight I suppose it is now when compared to what it probably should be doing, um, uh, were you happy with John Key's stance against the farmers? He basically told them, look guys, you get, you know, shut up and, and you get, you've got to put up with this. You've got to help us out now. Well, <laughs> the problem is, is that the taxpayers will still be subsidising polluters under John Key's scheme uh, when the Ganges dries up, um, you know, we this scheme that John Key and Nick Smith have put into Parliament involves subsidising greenhouse polluters till the end of the century. Mm. Uh, it is the most extraordinary thing. The, the cost of this will, won't fall on polluters because someone's going to pay because we're going to have to buy carbon credits because New Zealand's emissions keep increasing. Um, and the cost of buying those carbon credits will fall on the taxpayer instead of the polluter. So... No, I don't give I don't give National any credit whatsoever. They are weakening the scheme and weakening New Zealand's climate change response at a time when all the science tells us that it's actually more urgent. Mm. Uh, and now some icebergs heading our way. Will you be going to visit them? <laughs> give, no. Getting some real they, they, real perspective on it. <laughs> I'm I'm very happy to um very happy to watch it on telly. The icebergs wandering up. Mm. I mean, you know. They're now saying that, you know, the East Antarctic ice sheet looks like it's losing about 60 billion tonnes of ice a year. We thought the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is a really big one, um, would probably be gaining a bit of ice because of extra precipitation turning into, into snow and then ice on, in Antarctica. Yeah. Um, but actually it looks like it's losing it. The, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which we all knew was starting to melt, um, it's losing somewhere in the order of 130 billion tonnes of ice a year into the ocean. This is very significant. When the Antarctic ice sheet starts to melt at this kind of pace, then we're going to have big impacts. People are born today who are going to see a big impact from the melting of Antarctica. And it's not just uh, Antarctica, of course, it's, it's our own glaciers here in New Zealand. What, what, are, they, what are they saying? Re reduced by 50%? Yeah, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah, I mean, the glaciers here are melting as well. It's, you know, it's a global phenomenon. The climate is changing. And, you know, <laughs> I, I sat in Parliament last night listening to these drongos, and it's like the, the climate is changing right in front of our eyes, and all the evidence is building about it. And what is the government's response? Oh, let's weaken the climate change regulations. Mm. Let's actually increase New Zealand's greenhouse emissions. Like, what planet are these people on? Sadly, they're from mine. Mm. Is, is John Key right, though, that the Copenhagen around, that it's a bit of a, just a photo op, that nothing is going, there's no point in him going there. There's nothing's going to be decided. Well, actually, you know, the New Zealand government's position, which is to undermine Copenhagen and try to avoid any kind of agreement, with governments like that, yeah, it'll be hard to get the outcomes we need. But there are... There is a desperate need to actually get an agreement. There are a lot of people going to Copenhagen from a lot of countries that are trying to get an agreement. New Zealand isn't one of them. We're trying to break the agreement. Um, but, you know, it, it's critical that we do get some kind of binding commitment out of Copenhagen. Now, we may not get it, and it's true, 
Uh, but remember, the same thing happened with Kyoto. We didn't get it at the first meeting, we got mm. it at the second. Mm. So if we lay the legal framework for a binding um, commitment in the second round of, of meetings, then that's fine. Much better that we get something that means something rather than some kind of just waffly words at Copenhagen. Russell Norman, co-leader of the Greens, thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. Track now from Lawrence Arabia. This is called Fine Old Friends. Where do we